Welcome to the weekly Comic Web Old Time Radio Program podcast. We sell old time radio programs, Golden Age comics in PDF format, and we have other free podcasts. Visit comicweb.com for more information or find us on Facebook and iTunes. This week, our podcast features an episode of The Shadow called Death and the Easter Bonnet. It first aired on March 28, 1948. again, your neighborhood blue coal dealer brings you the thrilling adventures of the shadow, the hard and relentless fight of one man against the forces of evil. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcefully to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Friends, there has been no interruption in the mining of blue coal. Every working day, the blue coal mines are producing at full capacity. Yes, householders can fill their bins with blue coal this spring and be sure of the same steady, healthful warmth next winter they have enjoyed this year. Because of the shortage of other fuels, the demand for hard coal has greatly increased. And for your safety and comfort next winter, we want to make this suggestion. Place your order this spring, the sooner the better, for the coal you will need next winter. Don't take a chance. Call the nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow and ask him to schedule your spring delivery of blue coal. America's finest hard coal. The Shadow, who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, Death and the Easter Bonnet. the kind of an Easter bonnet I want, but there just isn't anything like it in any of the shops this year. Lamont, you're not listening. Hmm? Mm, yes, yes, I am, Margaret. You're talking about hats. Well, I don't know how you know that. You're not paying the slightest attention. Well, I pay attention to know that. What'd you say? Mm, nothing. They try to palm off any old thing on you in the stores, but the one I buy must be beige, have a white bird wing, and two red chairs. No chop nuts? Lamont, you're impossible. Can't you see how lovely it would be? Beige with a pair of dark red cherries and a white wing. Well, why don't you buy one? Well, I've tried. There are just a few little out-of-the-way shops that I haven't been to yet. And I don't intend to give in until I've exhausted the town. Say nothing of me. What's that? No, uh, nothing. No. Well, somewhere in this city, there must be a beige hat with... Hmm. I'll get it. Hello? This is Geraldine Granberry Smythe, Margot. Oh, yes, Mrs. Granberry Smythe. Listen, my dear, I hope I'm not too late with the invitation, but I'm having a musical this afternoon at four. Oh, well, it's awfully sweet of you to ask me, Mrs. Granberry Smythe. Well, now, before you say no, my dear, it's going to be quite an affair. Raul Rafiki is the guest of honor. Raul Rafiki? Oh, surely you've heard of him, Margot. The great violinist from Bologna. Where's Bologna? Oh, it's a small country in Middle Europe. You utterly fascinating. And Raul is taking his entire smart set by storm. You'll never forgive yourself if you miss meeting him. Oh, say you come. Well, I intended to show up for my Easter hat this afternoon. But surely that won't take until 4 o'clock, dear girl. Well, I don't see why not. I've been at it practically all week. Have you tried the Baroness Yolanda shop? The Baroness Yolanda? Oh, yes. It's a charming little place just off Faulkner Square. Well, I've never even heard of it. Well, you're hearing of it now. They just drop in and mention Mr. Espiki's name. You think I'll find what I want? If it exists, my dear, you'll find it at the Baroness Yolanda. This is it, Lamont. The Baroness Yolanda shops at London, New York, and Southampton. I suppose you pay once for each shop. Well, you could hardly expect a woman like Mrs. Granbury Smythe to recommend a bargain basement. 
Yes. The lady would like to buy something. You're the Baroness Yolanda. I am. I'd like a hat, something special for Easter. Oh, are we, mademoiselle? Um, this perhaps pastel green with the sprig of the leaves of the valley. A very charming, don't you think? Yes, I do, but it isn't what I want. But perhaps mademoiselle has something definite in mind? I'll say, mademoiselle. If she will describe it to me, perhaps I could design it for her personally. Well, that's a wonderful idea. Look, I want a beige hat. Yes. With a white bird wing. White bird wing. And a pair of deep red cherries. Doesn't that sound divine? Yes. Who sent you here? I was told to mention Mr. Rossiti's name. I see. So do you think you could? Could what, mademoiselle? Design it for me. I do not have to design it, mademoiselle. That hat is here. Ready and waiting. What? Here, monsieur. Mademoiselle. The mark, look. It's almost exactly what I ordered. Naturally, mademoiselle. How much is it? Seventy-five dollars. Seventy-five dollars? For that kind of money, darling, you could buy a cherry orchard with a dove farm thrown in. I am sorry, monsieur, but that is the price. Come on, Martha. No, Lamar. It's just what I've been looking for. $75. I know it's expensive, but I've been saving up for this all winter. Besides, I always say it pays to buy nice things. You come out ahead in the long run. Mademoiselle will take the hat? Yes. I thought Mademoiselle would. You don't think that was a little on the extravagant side, Margaret? Just wait till you see how other women stare. Well, that's what you're after. You get better results wearing a picture of Gregory Peck on your head. You know, darling, you're very bright about most things. But when it comes to women's hats, you suddenly go blank. I'm sorry. Nothing more to say. I beg your pardon. What's that? I said I beg your pardon, but I couldn't have noticed in your hat. You see? That's the most charming thing I've ever looked at. Do you mind if I ask you where you've got it? Not at all. I just bought it at the uh, Baroness Yolanda's, right across the square. I see. I hope you'll forgive my intrusion. Don't mention it. She has some very lovely things. Drop in and look them over. Thanks, I intend to. Take your life savings. Lamont. Yes? I want a hat. Oh, we. Perhaps you would I like know a... what I'd like. I'd like a beige hat with two red cherries and a white bird wing. What? I wasn't told I had to repeat it. Who? Oh. Who sent you here? Red Spiggy. Where's the hat? I, I... Where is it? Why, uh, I'll tell you where it is. You sold it. You sold it to that girl who just walked out of here. <laughs> it, it, it is quite ridiculous, you know, Sherry. She asked for it. She knew everything. Even Red Spiggy's name, mind you. Who is she? But that I don't know, Sherry. Who is she working for? That I don't know oh, either. Oh, this really is incredible. Eh bien, I have made a mistake, my Sherry. Obviously, the deal is off, and our friend doesn't have to settle with me. Our friend won't get a chance to settle with you. What do you mean? I mean you sold us out. Oh, no, 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 Sherry. It was a mistake, just a little silly mistake. To prevent further silly mistakes, I'm going to settle with you myself. A gun. <laughs> no. No, no, please, put it away. I am so terribly, terribly afraid of guns, Sherry. Too bad, this is the last one you ever have to be afraid of. Sherry. Cab. Hey, taxi. Dear, yeah, we've been trying to get a cab for the last half hour. Not quite, Margaret. Well, last ten minutes, anyway. Cab. Oh, here's one. At last. All right, my lady, hop in. Come on. Might as well tell him to drive on. What do you mean? I've just discovered that I left my gloves in the Baroness Yolanda's shop. Oh. Baroness! Baroness! She doesn't seem to be here. No, she doesn't seem to be here, Margaret, but she is. Where? The floor at the end of the counter. Oh, What's the matter with her? Pretty serious complaint. What do you mean? She's dead. But, but she was alive just a few minutes ago. That was a few minutes ago. I'm going to call the police. There's probably a phone behind those curtains in the back. I'll take a look. 
What in the world happened here? Speculate about that later. Meanwhile... Margaret. What? Remember that girl in the street who asked you where you got your hat? Yes. Lying on the floor behind these curtains, unconscious. Uh, you're all right. You, you just fainted. That hat. I remember your hat. Now just relax. You're safe now. What happened to you? Happened. The Baroness. She's dead. Yes, yes I remember now. Easy. He was telling me his hat when he walked in. He? Who? His name was Gessler. At least that's what they called him. Maxine Gessler. Yes. Yes. There was an argument. About what? I don't know. They, they were speaking in foreign language. Then all of a sudden, he pulled a gun and shot her. Where did he go? That's all I remember. Did she seem surprised when he walked in? No, I think he must have been an old customer. Good. Margot. Yes? Uh, take that credit ledger off the desk there and look for the name Gessler. Just a second. E.S.G. E. Gabby. Jenny, yes. Here it is. Gessler. Maxine Gessler. Any address? Yes. 1041 Fairfax Street. Are you strong enough for the trip to Fairfax Street? Yes, I think. Lorna, I thought you were going to call the police. I am. After I've interviewed Mr. Maxine Gessler. Piece of architecture as you're likely to see. Oh, why? Like you hold on the cab, Margo. You mean I'm to stay down here? In the event of trouble, it'd be tougher to have you both with me. This young lady has to go along to identify Mr. Maxime Gessler. The right place. Look, on the bell there. Maxime Gessler, apartment 2C. All right, come on now, as quietly as you can. Have you got a gun? No. What? Don't you think you should have? In a spot like this, the element of surprise is worth more than heavy artillery. There we are, to see. We step to one side in case there's any trouble. See? What trouble? There won't be any trouble if you keep your hands in the air. Yes, just so. And show proper respect for this very admirable firearm. Gessler? Maxine Gessler, your servitor. And in case you have not been properly introduced, the young lady at your side is my very able compatriot, Miss Nadia St. Law. Get inside. A trap, I take it, Miss St. Law? I'm sorry I had to lead you on, Mr. Cranston, but you'll forgive me when you see how much we need you in our business. Good work, Nadia. I took some fast thinking to get them here. When you phoned, you spoke of a young lady who had the hat. Yes, she's downstairs in the cab. I see. Here, take the gun. Thanks. Just keep Mr. Cranston occupied while I fetch the young woman. No. Out of my way. Take your hands off, Margot Lane. Nadia. Yes? I'm going to have to use violence with Mr. Cranston here. He tried to defend himself in any way, shoot to kill. Understand? Yes, Maxine. You have made this necessary. Sir! Oh. Oh. You say Lamont sent you down to get me? Yes, he wants you immediately. But he's all right. Well, never better. And the young woman? Miss St. Law, she's in excellent health, as you will see. Uh, up these stairs, please. What in the world is this all about? I buy an Easter bonnet, and the next thing I know, I'm in the middle of a blood and thunder adventure. You'll find out very soon, Miss Lynn. And when you Margo. do, you... Mr. Lamont. Margot, stay out of here. Stay out, you understand? Mr. Lamont, what's the matter? Run, run me. Hold it. Lamont! Lamont! Oh. Open the door, Nadia. I had to stop him, that thing. I understand. I had to pacify Miss Lane. Getting quite excited. What did you use? Blackjack. I trust I did not damage her lovely Easter bonnet. We'll return to the shadow in just a minute. Friends, there has been no interruption in the mining of blue coal. We're glad to be able to tell you this because it means you'll be able to fill your bin this spring and be prepared against a possible fuel shortage next winter. Now, here's another important springtime suggestion. You know how the spring weather changes from balmy to freezing in a few hours? Well, that's when you most appreciate automatic temperature control. 
Why not have it now? Install a blue coal temp master with the electric eye thermostat. It will bring you years of carefree heating comfort. You need never go to the basement to adjust furnace dampers. You need never trouble yourself about regulating the temperature in your home. Because the marvelous new electric eye thermostat will watch it for you. You simply set the upstairs control, and furnace dampers will be automatically opened or closed as needed. You're assured of steady, even healthful warmth at all times. And besides that, the new Blue Coal Temp Master Heat Regulator will cut your fuel consumption. Modernize your furnace with a Blue Coal Temp Master. It's easy and inexpensive to install. Tomorrow, call the nearest Blue Coal dealer and ask him to demonstrate the new Temp Master thermostat. And now, back to the shadow. came to, she discovered that she and Lamont had been dragged into a back room of Gessler's flat. In motionless silence, they both listened, as in the next room, Gessler and the girl, Nadja, examined her Easter bonnet. Well, have you found it? Not yet, but... Oh, wait a minute. There should be something thrown in under the bed. Here, give it to me. Yeah. Now we just rip out the stitches. <clears throat> and there we are. Is that it? C over pi m squared plus u over 7. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Our friends will be very pleased, eh, Maxine? Let us hope so. Tell me, our friend, is he going to be late? Uh, let's see. He is his usual punctual self. He will be here within a minute. You think he'll have our money with him? I'm sure he will. He has their funds completed at his disposal. Whose funds? The funds of the Royal Wallonian government. Something is always. Mr. Gessler, sir? Won't you come in, sir? Oh, thank you. You are prepared for my coming? Uh, yes, sir. The formula is here. Exactly as we agreed. Excellent. May I have it, please? Um, <clears throat> uh, before we make delivery, I think it only fitting that we collect our wages, sir. Exactly as we agreed. Five thousand. Exactly as we agreed. Thank you. And now the formula, if I may? There you are. I am most indebted to you. Now I come to a most unpleasant aspect of our relationship. Unpleasant? Why? I'm on highly criminal business in this country, and one thing is most apparent. What's that? I would be most unlucky if you decided to send me out before I have taken my departure from You the should shore. have thought of that before. Oh, I did, Miss Nasha. And I made plans to take care of this contingency. What sort of plans? This sort. Oh, no. Put down that gun. I am sorry, Maxime. Most sorry, Nacha. But I cannot jeopardize the interests of my country. Please, please, I beg you. Don't. You can trust us. You can trust us. <laughs> Let's dig it. Let's dig it. Come on. Easy down. Shot. What's happened out there? We've got all too clear a picture. Stand back. Why? We're going to smash this door. seems to have taken care of the book. He shot them. Did you hear what Gessler called him? Respighi. Yes. Raoul Respighi. That is his name. Gessler. He thought I would betray him, and now I shall live up to his expectations. Now listen. The formula sewn into the head was stolen from, from the United States government laboratory. What? It gives complete instructions for the building of the midget cyclotron. Midget cyclotron? The last development in the cheapest and quickest method of producing atomic weapons. Where can we find her speaking? Uh, Where is he going? Going. We will find him. 642. Yes, yes. Yes. Too late. Yes. What does that mean? It's where we're speaking. It's gone. I, I don't understand. Well, neither do I. All I know is we've got to stop him. Let's call the police. That's too late. He'll waste no time being on his way now that he's got that formula. It's up to us. Margot. Yes? You heard about Respighi only this morning. Yes. 
through Mrs. Granbury Smythe. See. You mustn't forget your manners, darling. My manners? A nice little girl would call up and apologize to Mrs. Granbury Smythe for missing her afternoon musical. <laughs> I'm afraid I won't be able to get to your musicale this afternoon. Oh, that's quite all right, dear. In fact, it's just as well. What do you mean? It's all over. Uh, Mr. Respighi had to leave on urgent business. When? Oh, about 20 minutes ago. He left me about 20 minutes ago. Yes, Cordy, looks like. This is Granbury Smythe. What does Respighi look like? Why? Why do you ask? Oh, well, I, I saw someone on the street today, and I just had the idea it might be he. Oh, uh, gold rim glasses. Yes. Short black beard. Yes. Tall, carrying a violin case. Yes, yes. Then you saw him, darling. Oh, thanks. Uh, I suppose you have no idea where he's going. Who said I didn't? I know exactly where he's going. You do? I heard him phoning the Central Railway Station for my living room. Yes? He reserved a ticket on the Gold Express for San Francisco. San Francisco? Yes. It leaves at 642. <laughs> Time's the clock, say. 6.40, Lamont. We've made it. We haven't found the Golden Express yet. There it is, Margot. Track 14, Golden Express. Look, Lamont, it's pulling off. Quick, come on. We'll have to jump for it. Oh, home free. Oh, I never thought we'd make it. I want to find out Mr. Espeaky. Excuse me. Oh, let the man by. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, by the way, I, I beg your pardon. Yes? We're looking for a gentleman you may have seen. Yes. He's tall, wears golden glasses, and a short dark beard. Oh, no, no, I don't. I don't think I've seen him. He speaks with a foreign accent. No. I... Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I've seen him. He's up ahead. Yes, where? At car four. I, I heard him talking to the conductor. Thanks very much. You stay here, Margot. No, no. There may be trouble. Well, then shouldn't you ask this gentleman to go along with you? No, him? thanks, sweetheart. This is a confidential matter. But if there's trouble, you may meet someone. There's trouble, I'll have someone. Who? The shadow. Come back to you later, my lady. <laughs> It's a very serious matter. Well, who's this guy looking for? His name is Respighi. Raul Respighi. Raul Respighi? Well, why don't you say so? What do you mean? The guy in car four isn't Raul Respighi. I've seen pictures of him. And Lamont's off in a wild goose chase. Respighi's a concert violinist, isn't it? Yes. Well, the violin case here on the platform. Where? Yeah, right here. See? Oh. There's a tap on it. What does it say? Well, Mr. R. Compartment three. Mr. R. Speaking. Where is compartment three? Next car. You want to go along? Will you go along with me? It's that I didn't. Right. Here we are. Compartment three. Hello, hello in there. Nobody at home. Try the door. It's a knock. Huh? Can we go in? Yes. Quick. No, we've got to work fast. Maybe right here in this room. You sound like somebody in a spy movie. Well, no wonder. What we're looking for is some confidential government papers. Really? How confidential? They're practically invaluable. I don't find any chance of secret formula for a midget cyclotron. Why, yes. How do you know? Because I happen to have it here in my wallet. I thought it wisest to remove the glasses, beard, and accent until I'm safely out of America. <laughs> I'm a very cautious man. Let's you. And I'm sure you would have been wiser to have kept your lily white nose out of this situation entirely. But since you have not, being such a cautious individual, I shall have to take rather definite steps. If you pull that trigger, they'll hear you outside. I hardly think they could above the noise of the rails. They could hear if I screamed. Perhaps. But it will do you no good. I have bolted the door on the inside. <laughs> you amuse me, young woman, trying to play an intrigue with a man whose business is intrigue. However, well, amuse me though you do. I can no longer afford the luxury of your presence. Please don't! Please don't! Don't you! What happened? What's going on here? The window suddenly broke. Something cries through the pane. But there's nothing inside. I don't understand. <laughs> What happened to your accent, Mr. Espeaky? Who was that? Shadow. Who's that talking? I cannot see anything. I am the Shadow. 
Now take that formula, Rispiki. Don't come near me. Now take that formula. You touch me, I'll pull this trigger and kill this young woman before your eyes. No. I don't think so. I assure you I will. It may interest you to know that a Mr. Cranston discovered there was no man fitting the description he gave you in car four. He wanted to head to the next stop to have you picked up. What difference does that make? She'll be dead before we reach the next stop. We are at the next stop. What? The train has stopped, Rispiki. And if you turn around, you'll see there are three American-made police revolvers leveled at you through the broken window. <laughs> it seems like it all happened 20 years ago, doesn't it, Lamont? It's been less than a week. All I can say, it was a tough way to get an Easter bonnet. <laughs> no, I'll get it. Right. Registered letter for Miss Marvelaine. I'll take it. Sign here. Huh? Well, it's for you, Margot, from the Scientific Research Foundation. For me? What is it? Over. See. The Mark Hmm? In recognition and reward for your effort in retrieving invaluable paper of a secret and confidential nature, we enclose a check for five hundred dollars. Well, that ought to teach you, Lamont Cranston. Teach me what? The hat cost me seventy-five dollars, didn't it? Yes. And the check is for five hundred, so I'm four hundred and twenty-five ahead. You see now, don't you? See what, though? That I was right. It pays to buy nice things. To come out ahead in the long run. <laughs> And now let me present Blue Coal's distinguished heating authority, John Barclay. Thank you, Andre Baruch, and good evening, friends. It's not too early to plan the spring checkup and cleanup of your furnace, and to make arrangements with your Blue Coal dealer to have that essential job done. Yes, it's essential to good heating and operation that will save you money next winter, and to prevent costly rust damage while your furnace is idle this summer. Blue Coal dealers have specially trained men and special equipment to do a quick, thorough, dust-free, and inexpensive job of cleaning your furnace. They can also make the minor repairs necessary. Your blue coal dealer will receive many calls to cook, clean, and repair furnaces, so it would be wise to call him now and make sure that he'll be able to fit your job into his schedule. Better make a note right now to call the nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. I thank you. This story is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Again next week, the shadow will demonstrate that... The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, your friendly blue coal dealer brings you another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. The shadow is presented by the DL&W Coal Company, distributors of blue coal. Lamont Cranston is played by Brett Morrison. Margot by Grace Matthews. Your announcer is Andre Baruch. Remember, it's blue coal for finest heating service. It's blue coal for finest modern equipment. It's blue coal for the best home heat money can buy. Lamont Cranston, a man of means, an amateur criminologist, and a master of mental control, would protect the innocent, cloud the minds of the guilty, and fight for justice. Learning hypnotic practices from the Orient, Lamont could hide himself in plain view from the guilty, allowing him to overhear their plans or create illusions to destroy them. He can look into the hearts of the guilty and allow their guilty conscience to grow and consume them. If you hear the laugh of the shadow, your doom is near. The shadow could go where the police could not or would not go. The bumbling police would often take credit for the shadow's work, but would still try to capture him. The stories would pit the shadow against crime bosses, murderers, werewolves, ghosts, and the unimaginable. 
Cranston's partner and love interest is Margot Lane, the only person to know the Shadow's secret identity. The Shadow was on the air from 1930 to 1954. The Shadow was originally just the host of a detective story radio program, but he proved so popular that they created a whole show just for him. The role of the Shadow was played by many actors, not surprising seeing as how the show lasted over 20 years. The most famous of all was Orson Welles, who played the character from 1936 to 1938. Orson left the Shadow when he made it big with The War of the Worlds. Oh yeah, and Citizen Kane. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next week.